Welcome to Macro Musings, where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the most important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I am your host, David Beckworth, a senior research fellow with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm glad you've decided to join us. Our guests today are Skanda Almanath and Preston Mui. Skanda is the executive director of Employee America, a think tank that promotes full employment in the American economy. Preston is a senior economist at Employee America. Skanda and Preston join us today to make sense of U.S. disinflation and the debates surrounding it, as well as what we can expect from Fed policy this year and beyond. And finally, the Fed's framework review set to begin later this year. Skanda and Preston, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Nice to be here. Great to have you on. Now, Skanda, you've been on before. This is Preston's first appearance, so we'll make sure that you get a nominal GDP targeting mug, Preston. Of course, Skanda has given me his own mug, the GLI mug, Gross Labor Income Targeting Mug. They're related in the same family, and we're going to have a fun time talking about them later near the end of the show when we talk about the Fed's framework review, a very important topic. But before we do all that and jump into Fed Minutia, let's talk about Employee America for a few minutes. So tell us about what you're doing and what you've accomplished. All right. So Employee America was founded to focus on the macroeconomic policies relevant to full employment, both sort of helping advance full employment outcomes and sustaining them over time. As we've kind of found out over the last, call it two and a half, three years now, Inflation itself has its sort of secondary impacts in terms of what people think is possible on the full employment front. If inflation's high, people think the answer is slack labor markets. That's not how we think about things at Employ America, both because we think full employment is really valuable, but also because there are a lot of other things that affect inflation. So among the set of policy advocacy objectives and priorities, we really focused in on a lot of other sources of inflation where there may be something to do on policy that can at least help at the margin, if not more meaningfully. And one one particular place I'd focus on are energy and specifically the price of crude oil and refined products. That's a place where the Strategic Petroleum Reserve actually can do some pretty helpful things, both in terms of how it chooses to release crude oil, but also how it chooses to buy back crude oil over time. Yes, commodities are in one sense forward-looking markets, but also markets that have to clear in spot. And so small changes in supply and demand can actually have some pretty big impacts on price. Commitments to buy in the future can have impacts on investment in the present. And ways of structuring that, we've been pretty active in trying to shape what Department of Energy regulation looks like, what Department of Energy policy looks like. And I'd say, I don't want to toot my own horn too much, but I think we've had a pretty significant impact on what realized policy looks like in this space. Absolutely. I've been following you guys since 2019. Uh, your former uh, leader, Sam Bell, was on this program with you back in 2019, Skanda, and you guys have been very ambitious. You've done a lot. And I should add, you've also been recognized by Nick Timoreos, the Wall Street Journal, with your PCE inflation forecast. Is that right? That's right. I mean, PCE is the Fed's inflation gauge. They forecast headline PCE, a measure excluding food and energy, a measure that focuses on non-housing services. And there's data that comes out before the official PCE data comes out that allows us to map a big chunk of PCE, when I, I mean, mostly like 95 to 99% of it in terms of accuracy. And yet that takes a lot of detail-oriented work. We are a macro-oriented organization. We try to understand the macro variables in terms of how they're constructed, how they're measured, and really understand the causal structure behind all this. So you have to know what's driving inflation too. I think it's a, that that is a much more interesting question, especially over the last three years. And developing careful ways of now casting this information, there are a lot of investment banks that do it. Employee America is not an investment bank, but we've also have that kind of modeling infrastructure in place to be able to do that well. There are a lot of other third-party research firms that also try to do this type of work. We we just pride ourselves on being super detail oriented. I think Nick at the Wall Street Journal has been kind enough to also publish our nowcasts, which I think hold up about as well as anyone else's. And I think in terms of the detail and causal richness with which you can describe things is something that our readers value. Now, most of our listeners know who Nick Timoreos is, but for those who don't, he is the 
Fed beat reporter for the Wall Street Journal. He definitely has the ear and the attention of the people at the Board of Governors, regional banks. A lot of times he'll break news about the Fed. So very important person in this policy space. And what's interesting is he'll sometimes on Twitter, right before the PCE release, he'll put out all these estimates. And you mentioned years, but as well as uh, Goldman Sachs, Citi, JP Morgan Stanley, UBS. So you're up there being cited by the Wall Street Journal. So that's an impressive feat. And we didn't take any TARP money to do it. So, uh. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, let's jump into this big debate about what has caused disinflation. So we had the big inflation surge. So summer of 2022, at least the CPI reached 9%, a little bit less for the PCE. It's come back down quite a bit, about six percentage points down. So a pretty rapid drop since then. And there's been a lot of discussion about what has caused it. Why are we at this point? Did the Fed have some role to play in it as well? There's the discussion over who won, team transitory, team permanent, and probably will never resolve this issue. But you have done your part, Skanda, to kind of broker the peace among the various parties with an essay you wrote titled, 10 Thoughts on the Tribal Transitory Debate as We Enter 2024. So you have 10 points. We'll work through them, and you can kind of summarize the points. I'll I'll read them off to you, and you tell us what's going on with each point. So the first one is, if people can't agree on what everyone else meant by transitory, the debate is futile. Explain. I think productive debate is based on mutual understanding of the best version of your opponent's argument. Right? That's to say that I really understand where you're coming from, the steel man version of it, not the straw man, and to engage productively because even their, your best version of your argument could be wrong. And I think in the case of all of the arguments that have been put forth by a lot of different people who come in various flavors of transitory, various flavors of persistent or whatever the, the counterpart anti-transitory is, they all came in different shapes and sizes. And it tends to be easier to poke holes at the straw man of each than to actually engage with the most, the richest version of the other. I think one succinct way of saying the problem with how people talk past each other is for some, transitory was a description about time. It was about an outright call on how long inflation was going to last. Was it going to be a two-month phenomenon, a two-quarter phenomenon, two years, or something more permanent? Or the kind of thing that was more permanent in the other side that had to only come down with particular conditional outcomes? Was inflation conditionally high based on where the labor markets were and possibly a story about inflation expectations? You could believe that inflation was not being caused by labor market slack or inflation expectations, but also that it might last a long time. That's kind of some of the challenges between outright prediction and conditional prediction. And so I think there was a lot of talking past one another that probably made for a messy debate, a little bit, uh, I'd say there's a lot of tribalism here that I think is ultimately unhelpful for trying to uncover some level of consensus and insight in this process. So that's kind of what I meant by the debate is futile, if we don't kind of get to some mutual understanding and about what the other side is really saying. And I wonder if to some extent, we are framing this question in the wrong way. And by that, I mean, the real question I think we should be asking is, was the inflation worth it? <laughs> you know, was that a necessary cost to get us through the pandemic? It's the price we had to pay to avoid a deep recession. You know, what are the trade-offs? Not that necessarily we want high inflation or we want to have a sharp contraction, but what are the trade-offs and maybe what is the counterfactual world as opposed to saying transitory versus permanent supply versus demand? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a critical question for Employee America, much more critical than actually who won the the team transitory, anti-transitory debate. I think that's a little less important than just drilling down to the stakes of, do we need to raise unemployment to solve these challenges? Because let's face it, if you really wanted to hit the 2% target tomorrow, right, you could say, well, we're not going to get there unless we produce mass unemployment. So the solution is, to get to 2%, if we're really serious about it, let's like hit the economy with a hammer as much as we can. We'll get pricing power down and problem solved. But like, is the cost worth it to go about policy that way? Or can you have enough confidence to say there are policies that take time to have effect or else there are dynamics that ha- take time to have effect? And 
we were trying to get to 2% over a longer run. There may be some reasons for one-time price level changes. There may be reasons why these shocks are going to have a certain effect on prices. And in the absence of that, it's going to have an effect on output to the downside. And that kind of welfare cost trade-off is actually something that's very messy and I feel like under-discussed in macro oftentimes, which is to say we don't always have a great story for the welfare costs of inflation to match the stories about the more identifiable welfare costs associated with recessions, specifically not earning a market income, not being able to consume in the same capacity. That Those are like very tangible welfare costs. It's not to say inflation is clearly frustrating, politically frustrating, I suspect economically frustrating, but that those welfare costs are actually quite messy. I think the Fed is tilting the other way from saying we there must be pain to solve inflation towards the story of, hang on a sec, soft landing is feasible. We can aim for something a little bit more balanced, and we do not have to cause a recession to manage these inflationary dynamics over time. And I think that's a much more optimistic read, but I think it's actually also a more accurate read of where we are right now. Yeah, I think it's great that we're having this conversation and not one about, well, how steep is this recession going to be? Could the Fed have done less? You know, instead we're discussing, hey, we're having a soft landing. What was the causes of it? Was it the Fed tightening? Was it the natural healing of the market? That's a much better and pleasant conversation than having, you know, 8, 10% unemployment and what's the best path forward for the Fed. So I think we should be optimistic, as you said. Look at the glass half full, not half empty moving forward. Let's go to point two in your essay. You say there's a shift in policymakers' perceptions and it can have generational implications. I would say for the last, call it, I don't know, few decades now, there has generally been a tendency to say, okay, we can have like incrementally more labor market improvement. But the moment we see inflation, we're going to freak out and we're going to have to like tame the beast. I think that's something that has lurked for a long time, but because we've had low inflation outcomes for much of that period, those trade-offs don't always rear their head. But once inflation did rear its head in, in 2021 and 2022, you definitely saw a chorus of economists say, well, inflation's so high, it clearly must be about some kind of persistent labor market slack inflationary force that was going to stay with us forever. And the only way out of it is to raise unemployment. There's this vision of the story that actually happened in September, summer of 2008. And I think it's a story that I think nominal GDP targeters very much understand or have, have heard of before, but unfortunately has been buried from a lot of memoirs from the 2008 crisis, which was that in the summer of 2008, inflation was increasing. It was getting more broad-based. In my view, it was largely driven by commodity prices and supply-side forces, but it was also leaching into a lot more prices. It, it caused airfares to spike. There were a lot of other inflationary gauges that were increasing at a time when the economy was descending deeper into recession. And the Fed made a call at that time, collectively at least, that they were going to not try to ease policy to address the demand side of the financial crisis. So much so that even after Lehman Brothers failed and there was a big panic, the Fed did not in actually cut rates at that September FOMC meeting, which, which actually succeeded the failure of Lehman Brothers. I think that part tends to be buried in a lot of memoirs. I don't want to get to name names exactly, but I think it's pretty obvious that there's a tendency to paper over this part of history. Something that I know you're like you, David, and your fellow travelers have flagged, which is, hey, maybe the Fed couldn't have rescued things totally, but they clearly didn't do all that they could in September 2008 to support the economy. And the reason for that was inflation surged in, in 2008, I'd say for reasons that had to do a lot with commodity prices. But if you can actually get away from that and say, hang on a sec, let's look through some of this and let's actually realize inflation can be high, but the answer is not more unemployment. The, if the Fed comes out of it with saying we can manage this in, in a much more balanced manner and not just hit the panic button, not just try to hit the unemployment button, that has like huge effects on like the ability for labor markets to stay strong for much longer periods of time, I would say. Yeah, I think in this most recent episode, I think the Fed does deserve a lot of credit for resisting the worst of these calls for unemployment. So, you know, famously, Larry Summers said we need seven and a half percent unemployment to return to two percent. And while the Fed did put out various projections that said they were willing to take the economy to, say, 4.6 percent unemployment, they never really bought in fully into this view that we really need mass unemployment in order to bring inflation down. Yes, 
kudos to Jay Powell and his team at the Fed. Circling back to 2008, Scott, since you brought it up, it is shocking looking back that the FOMC could be so worried about inflation all the way up until, I believe, September 2008. And we had already seen multiple banks and, and parts of the, the economy begin to, to slow down. And yet inflation was kind of like the laser-like focus of the Fed at that time. And had they been looking at the broader economy or some other measure, maybe they would have taken a different view. But your point is there's this generational bias, maybe, or there's kind of way of thinking and looking at the world that fortunately, as Preston said, they didn't use as much in this past experience. Yeah, I think the order of operations in central bank speak and central bank policy tends to be inflation first, you get 2%, then maybe you get some good labor market outcomes. But what if inflation flares up for reasons that have nothing to do with the labor market and not necessarily great reasons that are really tightly tied to monetary policy? What do you do then? I think that's actually a very vexing question. It was one that basically the European Central Bank failed twice in 2008 and 2011. I think it's a challenge that the Fed, and look, there were obviously were a lot of hawkish uh, members at the regional Fed banks at that time. But I would just say, if you look through what Ben Bernanke, Don Cohn, Tim Keitner were saying in summer 2008, it was basically the, as a story of we're probably going to have to raise rates in 2008. <laughs> um, eventually, that was the direction of travel just because inflation is high and there's a risk of expectations de-anchoring. That was a story that was rooted in a lot of price data, reasoning from prices exclusively. Even as unemployment was going up, nominal aggregates were drastically decelerating over that exact same period. And I think that is, yeah, that's a part of the financial crisis story, a part of macroeconomic history that probably warrants a little bit more attention now, especially because we do see that we came up through an inflation surge and it turns out you can manage that without sacrificing the labor market to solve that problem. Well, I hope that is the lesson. We take a broader view and a more holistic approach and that we will move forward in this framework review to approaches that actually incorporate those lessons. So number three, I think we've touched on, and number three says the transitory debates were unhelpfully conflated with whether inflation was supply versus demand driven or narrow versus broad base. So let's go to number four. And you say number four, don't be a supply denialist. Talk us through that. Yeah, so I think supply was undeniably a part of the story. I remember uh, in late 2020, I was trying to buy brake pads for my bicycle and I couldn't find them anywhere. Uh, they just weren't on the shelves at all. And I think uh, a lot of people know about the run up in used car prices. If you look at the, the timeline of inflation during this period, you see inflation in durable goods, especially used cars, happens before the labor market gets quote unquote tight with the vacancies over and exceeding the number of unemployed people. And uh, over time, the Inflation in things like used cars starts to translate into inflation more broadly. So you start to see greater, uh, you know, increases in prices in transportation services such as auto insurance, auto repair, auto maintenance, which all have some kind of origin in the supply issue with automobiles. Fast forward to 2023, what what's happening to auto sales? Auto sales are ramping up, and so there's a clear recovery in, in, in supply. I was reading recently Mike Conksell at the Roosevelt Institute it has a piece where he shows that most of the of the categories of personal consumption where you see decreases in inflation are categories where quantity is increasing. Uh, we had 3% growth in real GDP over the past four quarters. To me, that really speaks to a supply issue in the beginning and a recovery in supply at the end. I think it's one thing to say a modest slowdown in call it GDP growth, real consumption growth was playing the pivotal role on the demand side. I think there are a lot of people who I think understandably buy into the notion of a nonlinear Phillips curve where small changes can have big impacts. The problem is just the direction of the change doesn't seem to be at odds with a lot of the core of the evidence, which is that we got actually real GDP acceleration. Productivity growth in 2022 Q3 was minus 2% year over year. Fast forward four quarters, it became plus 2%. So even on these like big macro variables, there's big swings. That kind of swing is actually something we don't really see outside of recessions dating back to probably what, 1965 or 1966. 
that's a long time. That's like a historic supply shock, I would say. And if you look, especially at the market-based components of consumption, there are a lot. Of, there's a lot of noise where we don't have market prices, and it's kind of stuff like nonprofit output and financial services. Cut through some of that noise. That's called market-based personal consumption. In real terms, that accelerated. That's pretty remarkable. Which is to say, like, it's really hard to tell a demand-driven story exclusively if you're in in the context of accelerating real outcomes. Which kind of gets us now probably to the second part of this, which is just about Demand itself, don't be a denialist about demand either, right? Demand itself also surged probably most meaningfully in 2021. There was obviously fiscal policy tailwinds, but there also was just also a big tailwind from what I'd call the reopening effect. We have reopening first of the services sector, which is probably not going to be offset by goods prices. So things like lodging, things like airfares, things like in-person recreation services, going to concerts. The pricing on that was going to probably normalize after capitulating in 2020. That was going to have a a price increasing effect relative to quantity. But in in, in addition to those dynamics, we also had the labor market itself. We went from a labor market that was on to off to on. And going from off to on in historic scale and speed is going to add a lot of demand. Demand for consumption. When people earn a new paycheck, earn a new market income, that really matters for the spending pattern. We saw this most visibly with sort of market rents surging in 2021, and then subsequently stabilizing. The rent inflation measures in PCE tend to have a methodological reason for a lag, but they seem to follow this sort of demand-driven process. I would not describe why rent inflation surged and then is now cooling as a supply-side phenomenon. And I think it's important to look through the cross-sectional details to be able to validate some of these mechanisms. But they're also like, This is a kind of demand phenomenon that's really tied to the growth bulge of 2021. We had a big growth bulge in 2021 and probably the first quarter of 2022 outside of GDP. And that was probably the biggest reason for why we had, so on the demand side, a big surge in inflation. And that that effect deserves to be treated seriously. And it's something that there are people who just say it's mostly about supply can easily dismiss at their peril. Yeah, I want to point out that this story that Skanda just told about the relationship between the labor market and inflation, where you have this rapid recovery in employment and wages and people have all this income to spend on things like rent and rent goes up, that's a much different story about the labor market and inflation than a lot of people have been telling about this this recent episode. So over the past few years, there's been attempts to try to explain inflation using some kind of measure of labor market tightness, such as the ratio of vacancies to unemployed. And those stories are generally about the labor market's tight, so it's hard to find workers. So the marginal cost of hiring that additional worker is really high and that price gets passed on. That's a much different story than the one we're telling. And if you look at things like, you know, rent inflation, I'm not really sure what rent inflation is supposed to have to do with the marginal cost of labor. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, this labor market tightness didn't matter at all. It may have mattered in certain sectors. But if you look at where we saw a lot of inflation and subsequent disinflation, it doesn't really seem to be something that you can really describe using this marginal cost of labor channel. So let me ask a question about the supply shock part of the story. So to me, clearly you tell a pandemic story, there's got to be some kind of negative supply shock going on somewhere. I mean, you can tell stories of people leaving the labor force, ports being closed, um, bike pads not being available. I remember trying to get exercise equipment back then too. I couldn't find that either. So there was certainly a lot of the supply side going on. But I think something else that was unique about this period, say compared to 2008 or other more generic supply shock stories, was this big preference shock too, right? Households went from, not entirely, but there was a sizable shift from service consumption to good consumption, right? There's this, it was a shift because of, of the pandemic, because we were locked up. And I know some people call that a supply shock. How would you define that? Because that was a meaningful part of the story too, right? You simply a shift from one sector spending to another, and I think you could say that the good sector, there was capacity constraints. We couldn't meet everyone's needs suddenly for weights. Like I went to go buy weights during the pandemic. How would you frame that or understand a supply shock or something else? 
I think the honest answer, even if it seems mealy mouthed, is both. I think there is like a clearly was a goods demand impulse, and there was a initial ability to supply goods that eroded over the course of the pandemic as inventories went fell and more supply chain stresses showed up. And the economy was able to handle a certain amount of flow of goods production and distribution. But we did hit supply shocks there. And because like these are things that are relatively untested, right? Goods demand seemed like it was in structural decline for a long time, but it turned out if the demand and the circumstance was right, there would be some binding constraints there. We saw a lot of rotation and services looked like they were very slack. It's very telling to me that real consumption looks to be running at a sort of very steady trend in a lot of ways. Like in the aggregate, it looks quite steady. In the sub-aggregates, there's a lot of level shifts up and down in various components to point to. And so that big rotation was probably something the economy was not in the short run prepared for. And I think now we've seen a more of a meaningful reversion to something that looks more normal between goods and services. I think of that as there is a supply component to it and there is a demand component to it. It would be kind of foolish to say it doesn't have that there's only one and at the expense of the other. And I think taking uh, one step back, it's also, this stuff is really tied to the pandemic, right? It's just like, and especially in 2021, I think there was an assumption, okay, va- shots in arms, people are going to vaccinate, industry is going to open up, boom, we're just going to, we're going to get going to a normal economy. That actual process took a lot longer than most of us anticipated. I will throw my hand up here completely, which was the pandemic's effects lingered on for a lot longer. The reopening effects lingered on a lot longer. Maybe some of that has to do with fiscal policy, but some of that's also just about Omicron it was, was a pretty important thing for air travel pricing and air travel output in Q1 of 2022. The reopening effects probably filter into a lot of recreation services well into 2022 and even parts of 2023. So these are all things that these shocks lasted a lot longer. The impulses were more relevant for a lot longer. I still see a lot of echoes of it, which why I wouldn't want to write a finite chapter on, oh, this is the end of inflation. I think it's like, this is still a work in progress. You know, I agree with you. And that was kind of a, you know, a leading question because I think both stories can be told, both supply and demand in that preference shock between services and goods. And I heard John Steinson tell this story. He's an economist at Berkeley. And, and I like his kind of interpretation of it. He goes, look, there was a sudden sh- increase in demand, real demand for goods, hits a capacity constraint. So for a given level of, of funding or, or spending, you have a, two choices. Either the prices of goods go up, and that's it. Or you can have goods prices go up, services fall, or you can have just services fall, some kind of adjustment. And policymakers clearly did not want service prices to fall because that's where you have a lot of the economy. You also have wages. There's a lot going on there. So they opted for the price of goods to go up and they provided the policy accommodation to allow that. So it was a supply shock accommodated by demand support. And, and again, you know, before we pass judgment on that, the question to ask, I think, is what was the counterfactual? And, and maybe it was a very awful deep recession. But let, let, me, let me switch gears then to the demand side question here. So, Skanda, if you do come across someone who is a demand denialist, what is your go-to, or Preston, yours too, what is your go-to like reply? Oh, yeah, well, what about this fact here? This tells me that demand played some role in the inflation surge. I would immediately jump to rent as the very obvious point where you had historically strong levels of rent inflation in the CPI and PCE measures in 2022 and 2023. Those measures are very understandably lag market rents, which surged in 2021. And I don't think there's a good supply story there, to be perfectly honest. I think there's not a, this is like a a big chunk of CPI, core CPI and core PCE. It is a big reason for the inflation overshoot that still remains is that it has to do with rent and rent lagging. The reason for that bulge is very hard to describe in terms of this altered supply of housing, right? That's not That doesn't make a lot of sense, at least in terms of what the housing supply wasn't con- actively constrained the way I'd say the production of automobiles was constrained. The production of a lot of commodities globally after the Russian invasion of Ukraine was constrained, or at least there was a lot of risk attached to it. But in the case of housing and rent, that bulge is mostly about demand. And I think that's something to be almost at peace with on some level because of, I mean, obviously the, the rent increases are very painful. And I don't think they're like ultimately 
then we have to find better solutions here. I don't mean to cast doubt on it, but I also want to say we had a surging employment recovery. And part of what comes with that territory is the likelihood of some areas where supply is just generally inelastic, right? I think like that's not because there are any unique inelasticity about housing. It's just about when people have jobs, they tend to be renters when they're, especially when they weren't, they didn't have jobs previously. And that kind of rental demand effect is an aggregate demand story. And it's also a story that shows up in ways that are pretty reliable over time. This is probably one of the few areas that are reliably considered, call it slack sensitive inflation, at least according to Stock and Watson, and their sort of slack and cyclical inflation paper kind of identifies this as like a key vector through which demand really does show up on the inflation front. Again, we, may, we should try to figure out better solutions here so it doesn't surge the next time we want to have a strong labor market recovery. But I do think like at a first cut, this is a part that I'm not, I wouldn't say concede. I think I would own to say like this is a very identifiable effect. We can see that the growth bulge of 2021 was going to have this type of impact. And I would say I would like to have the job growth of 2021. I'm glad it happened. I'm playing America. I am very supportive of a rapid recovery in labor market conditions. I think some of the other aspects of the inflationary episode we can hopefully learn and handle better, but it is true that like this is one place where it shows up. Okay, so Skanda and Preston, what I love about you guys is that you look underneath the hood. You get down into the engine, you get into the disaggregated data, and you can pinpoint. This is where we have evidence for you know, demand. Here's evidence for supply. I'm more of a macro guy, as you know this, right? So I kind of step back. I look at the hood of the engine. Is it getting hot? Is is it is it you know getting a little too warm? And so let me throw out my data points, and I, you, I want you to correct me, okay? I want you to kind of rein me in because that's the job of smart people like you. I'll, I'll give two things. One, you know, the U.S. government borrowed about five trillion dollars, and about three trillion of that was helicopter drop. It was financed through the Fed. And anytime you add something that sizable to the economy, you're going to somewhere, even in a normal state, you're going to somewhere get price pressures. And again, I'm, I'm not saying it was inappropriate. Maybe it was what was needed for the pandemic. I'm willing to concede that point. But to me, that clearly is, is a data point that suggests there was some strong demand pressures. And the other point I brought up to Skanda before, and that is simply the dollar size of the economy. It's, it's about two trillion dollars larger than its trajectory path. Now that's nominal GDP. And, and I know Skanda has corrected me that may not be a good measure because of the imprecise issues with nominal GDP. So I'll throw out market-based PCE, which is about 1.7 trillion higher than its pre-pandemic trend. So I would look at those two things. This, the, the fact that the dollar size got so much larger than anyone would have expected. And the fact that fiscal policy was so big. A am I being too strong here? Am I reaching too far? How would you respond to those observations? I think at some surface level is like, if you hit this stuff to an extreme, are you going to see it show up is kind of the argument I'm hearing, which is, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not written derisive at all. I think it's actually like, at the margin, if you hit the like this stuff, there's some effect, hit the stuff to an extreme, there should therefore be some effect. It's kind of a logical argument. There are reasons why that stuff doesn't always happen in a lot of cases, right? Where we think about money supply measures. Sometimes they predict in inflation so precisely, and other times they are a complete dud in terms of like 2009 and 10. A lot of people use various aggregates that were wrong. It's like, well, money supply obviously affects inflation at the margin, so surely it should uh, matter. But it's like, which, which one? And what's the causal mechanism? So I do think like, it's good to have high level intuitions. I'm not here to dismiss those, but I also think it's like good to like validate what was the mechanism here. Like the deficit itself to me is less important than what is the actual contribution to call it the flows in nominal expenditure, which there were, just to be clear, right? There were clearly big, big changes in transfer payments that show up almost instantaneously as changes in consumption and consumer spending. So like it's clearly there. And I think to a large part, if the goal was to get a rapid recovery and labor out market outcomes, if there was a goal of making sure consumption outcomes were reasonably kept whole, those actually look pretty good. But it's probably the case that you are like going to strain certain things. I think the challenge is there are other cross-cutting dynamics in this whole episode that are really hard to disentangle. I don't think it's impossible, but I do think like part of economics is about causal inference. It is about trying to be able to disentangle what actually happened and mattered, right? There are a lot of things that matter at the margin, but what really mattered and we say how much, not just say, well, 
okay, yes, fiscal policy clearly demand would have been weaker. Labor market would be weaker if we had less fiscal policy. That's probably true too, right? But that's also the kind of thing that is, it's good to put some numbers behind this stuff to be able to say, I see where these effects really show up. And to be fair, there are like evidentiary gaps on all sides. And I don't think that's the part that's the most exciting and interesting about this whole episode is we got to fill in those gaps to say, how much did this really matter? Did it matter a little bit? A lot? What other things can we really connect the dots all the way through to inflation, all the way through to consumption? I'd say, yeah, normal consumption is a lot stronger you know, than it, than it was pre-pandemic. That probably does matter. Why was nominal consumption also stronger? There, I would say nominal consumption aggregates are less supply distorted, but they also do show in various segments of nominal spending that when you get to inelastic points on the supply curve, prices spike more than quantity drops. And so it's not totally clean either. And in a way of just saying, this is all very messy. There are ways to unpack it, I think, but I don't think it's like that, that this is where like, I'm sure there will be economists who want to study this episode in particular in the years and decades to come. Oh, for sure. Let's move on to some of your other points. We won't, won't have time for all of them, but your next one I think is important and it takes us forward to where we are today. And that is the role of Fed policy on consumption. Because you know, one argument being made is the reason we have disinflation is because the Fed has you know, pushed up rates so rapidly. And as a result, it's part of the reason consumption demand has gone down. But you make the claim that the role of the Fed in consumption demand is far from settled. So walk us through that. Yeah, I think that there's an obvious connection between the Fed policy and let's call it asset prices. I don't think it's hard to see when the Fed hikes rates, it raises discount rates, it lowers asset prices across all asset classes. And it's not hard to see how it's, its effect on the housing market. So we saw housing permits, starts, sales all decline pretty much after the Fed began hiking interest rates. The problem with this story is all this stuff is not necessarily tied to consumption, which, as I said, has run quite strong. It's still quite strong in nominal consumption terms, and, and the level of nominal cons consumption here is quite strong. And real consumption growth has actually accelerated in 2023. And so, yes, lower asset prices also has a wealth effect that's negative. It should slow consumer spending. But at the margin, sure. But when I say unsettled, what I'm really talking about is how much. How much did this really matter? And that part is a little unclear. I think this is something where like, real consumption accelerating is a very odd thing to see happen alongside Fed tightening. One of the ways in which Fed policy is supposed to affect consumption also is like higher interest rates on auto loans. People, automobiles become more difficult to buy. And therefore, like real consumption of automobiles declines while prices also decline with it. The problem with it is in 2023, we saw unit sales accelerate at the same time that <laughs> prices were deflating or at least disinflating. And that combination is something you would describe more in supply terms and demand terms. So again, like where do we connect the dots? That's the tricky thing here. It could be about the labor market. There was a labor market slowdown. Maybe they slowed down the growth bulge from 2021 to get that down to something more sustainable. The Fed undeniably had a counterfactual effect. And you could even hear a lot of anecdotal stories about layoffs in the tech sector because like tech valuations took a hit. But the how much still feels very unsatisfying because a lot of the stuff that was slowing down began slowing down in 2021 itself. Labor turnover peaked in 2021 and started declining. There was a decline in hiring. That's just as you got up past the, the churn of reopening, the churn of people going back to their old jobs or entering new sectors, the reallocative effects that were kind of happening during the re reopening process. So I think that makes this a much trickier story to unpack. It doesn't mean the answer is zero. It, it does mean the Fed effects here are just like not decisive. And I'm, I'm just, I'm stunned on one level that 525 basis points. I don't see the smoking gun evidence yet. I don't know if Preston, you, uh, if you see things that here that are worth flagging as far as some of these data puzzles, yeah, it just seems like it's still quite vexing. Let's move on to the other points. And again, we don't have time for all of them because I want to get to your other interesting stuff. But let's end on the last two because I think this is important to this debate. I'm going to say both of them. And I think you can tie them together. And you, number nine, you say less point scoring, please. And number 10, more gratitude, please. So help us be better people in this debate. <laughs> I think that the point scoring point is just everyone got a lot wrong. 
This is a very unique historical episode. I wonder what people would have said during the Korean War inflation. That inflation surged to even higher heights then and then came down without a recession. There were a lot of different policies that were implemented at that time. But like, this is really messy. And I think the best thing to do is look inwards in terms of where you got forecasts wrong, try to learn from them. I do think that there's a lot of tribalism I see on Twitter, at least, about, well, it must be about the Fed. Well, it must be that it was actually transitory. It was right or it was wrong. And I just think that is not very helpful for understanding and building off of this episode for better macro policy in the future. What I will say is I'm really grateful that the labor market has at least withstood most of this very well. We have first world problems to what you were discussing earlier, which is that we have a labor market standing on its own two feet for right now, at least. Maybe that deteriorates, in which case we hope to see the Fed kind of kick into action more aggressively. But in the absence of that, like, like it's at least worth noting that we have a labor market that's on strong footing. And that's like, that's worth celebrating, even as we see inflation outcomes that are moving closer and closer to car- target consistent outcomes. Absolutely. We love to see the labor market healthy, at full employment, avoid hysteresis. I mean, there are so many people's lives who are being affected by this, not just now, but over the long run. We know you're in the labor market. It has a bearing on your health, your mental well-being, all these things that are, are essential to a well-functioning economy. All right, let's transition then to another paper that both of you put out. And this one is titled Three Motivations for Interest Rate Normalization, a Playbook for Fed Policy in 2024. So this brings us to the present. Here we are. You've just touched on this. Maybe the Fed will need to do you know, very aggressive rate cuts. So Preston, why don't you start us off on this paper? Yeah. So I just want to step back for a bit and talk about the context when we were writing this. So we put this out the week before the December 2023 FOMC meeting. And at that time, Pretty much no one on the committee wanted to talk about the prospects of rate cuts. Waller had just started talking about it. Bostic had talked about it for a while, but he was the one who was most open about talking about rate cuts. But if you asked Powell about it, Powell would say it's premature to start talking about rate cuts. You ask Kashkari about it. Kashkari says, there's no discussion amongst me or my colleagues about rate cuts. So we got to thinking about you know, what might the, the rate cut path look like in 2024, specifically in the, the scenario where inflation is falling, but it doesn't look like there are any obvious signs of unemployment risk or financial stability risk. Because it's well understood that if inflation remains high, then rates are going to stay high. And if there is a severe increase in unemployment, the Fed is going to pivot in some way. But, you know, what about the scenario where inflation is, you know, getting back to target as we have been seeing lately, and the labor market still looks, you know, reasonably okay, which, you know, has been the story for for most of the most of 2023, although the last, uh, we can talk about this later, although the last month looks a little troubling. So we call this uh, rate normalization. So basically, what would be the case for cutting rates, basically, in this in the path to the soft landing? And the timing was really fortunate because right after we put the piece out, we got really favorable inflation data. So favorable, in fact, that the Fed did pivot at the December meeting, acknowledged a lot of the disinflation. And now you have people talking left and right about, you know, what is a Fed rate path going to look like in 2024 is really you know, the, the hot topic, not just amongst the market participants, but, you know, the FOMC as well. So to that end, we have three motivations for wanting to cut rates in 2024 in the soft landing scenario. And associated with each motivation is uh, a strategy for policy. Yeah. I think the first one is in some ways recognizable. It's to say that the downside risks are nonlinear and somewhat unpredictable in terms of how they materialize. I'm specifically talking about downside risks to the labor market and financial stability. Right. And these are risks that in terms of easing generally, if there's visible deterioration in financial markets, if there's visible deterioration in labor markets, the case for aggressive easing is not that hard to figure out. Right. I think most people understand it. What's a little trickier to like conceive of is that these things also tend to snowball so quickly that just letting policy stance say significantly restrictive comes with its own perils and problems. I think back to like what happened in 2007 has some of its origin story in what the Fed was doing. The Fed raised rates pretty aggressively to 5.25% and broke the housing market in part, I'd say, not in, not entirely due to the Fed, but the Fed's 
policies did eventually lead to contractions in residential fixed investment, that led to contractions in construction employment that spread to the labor market. And you leave these policies in place for long enough, they do have an impact. They had an effect on the corporate credit market when the Fed kept raised rates aggressively. They had the same effect on, in 1990 from like the savings and loans crisis has some of its interactions with Fed policy. A lot of in- business decisions were made based on interest rates that were lower than where they are right now. And so this is sort of adjustment costs and issues that are kind of at the core of say, the SVB crisis in March, where we had interest rate assumptions that were just offsides. And it did help spawn some of the bank run dynamics that we we saw among regional banks. That's all just a reason to say like some of the stuff is out of sight, not perfectly foreseeable, but is an upshot of keeping interest rates significantly restrictive for too long. And now that the inflation outlook has improved, like the need to take active risk on the financial stability side, active risk in terms of labor market deterioration is also diminishing. And that itself is like a reason to walk away from significantly restrictive policy rates, in our view, at least. And I think the strategy around the interest rate path has some pretty big upshots there, too. So this nonlinear downside risk, is it similar to this notion of the last mile being really tough or potentially really tough, the last mile of getting to 2% or is that a distinct notion? I think that's a distinct notion in the sense that I think this is more about how asymmetric, once unemployment gets beyond a certain point, once things start to snowball, that's a better way to put it. These sorts of things, once they attain a certain critical mass, it's very hard to reverse. It's very hard to play catch up. The Fed cut rates a lot in 2001, and it just proved to be way too late. And similarly, you could say the Fed actually did cut rates quite a bit in 2007, 2008. It just happened to be after a lot of the damage was already forming, a lot of the cracks were starting to emerge. Like it's better to walk away from this a little earlier, a little sooner, and it can actually lead to like a more sustainable outcome over the longer run than just say, I'm only going to cut after we are, <laughs> we see a lot of visible damage in either labor markets or financial markets. These things are just, they're not irreversible, but they're very hard to reverse once they're in motion. Yeah. So, so Skanda talked already about the financial risk and how that can kind of sneak up on you when it comes to unemployment, for example. Something you can do is graph the change in unemployment and you know do it on a histogram or something. And you can see that when un- unemployment goes up, it increases really quickly over a short period of time. Whereas when unemployment falls, it, it takes a long time and it, you know, it falls more, more steadily. So basically, by the time you've seen the whites of unemployment's eyes, it's too late. You, have, you're, you were supposed to act yesterday, not today. And so we think that the appropriate policy response here is to front load cuts. You can go on the margin, you can go faster when you have higher confidence that you're significantly restrictive, which we are now. And as you get something that's closer to something that looks like a neutral policy stance, you can go marginally slower. So we think that as the Fed cuts rates, they should probably do so faster at the beginning, and then they can slow down as time goes on. We're talking about this in the context of being forward-looking and preemptive. If we actually see visible deterioration, there's a stronger case for it aggressive easing. What we're talking about here is just getting away from significantly restrictive. Neutral is always debatable about where is the neutral interest rate, where is neutral policy stance. And there's a healthy debate to be had. But I don't think that as we get closer to that, move slower, move more prudently, makes sense. But right now we're at 5.33% interest rates. And that's a lot of risk that the Fed has bitten off. I think we see signs right now in the labor market, in the fog of the data, There may be points of deterioration in certain areas that might be real. They might be noise. But I just want to make sure we're separating out. Like There is a case for aggressively responding to active deterioration, and that might mean much more aggressive easing. And then there is the case for just trying to get interest rates into a slightly more normalized place and policy stance into a more normalized place after moving them to more restrictive territory in a pretty aggressive and rapid manner. So your second motivation is to be consistent on inflation. How so? I think that the legibility of Fed policy to a first approximation is pretty sensible. That 5.33% Fed funds rate is a result of high inflation, right? That's the main reason. There was maybe a lot of discussion about overheated labor market, but the labor market also, in a lot of measures, has shown a lot of cooling. Job turnovers come down to pre-pandemic rates. Wages are broadly decelerating. These are all things that are happening, even if labor markets slack may not be as visible. And so 
the main reason if inflation is the reason why we're at this point, and if inflation is falling, normalized labor market outcomes, normalized inflation outcomes should mean normalized interest rate outcomes. I think the Fed on the in terms of the hiking cycle and why they chose to take interest rates to where they are, I think of what they did with Taylor rules as an aspirational upper bound for policy rates. They kind of knew that inflation, not all of it would stick. We weren't going to stay at 9% CPI. We're not going to stay at these wildly high poor inflation rates even, but they didn't know how far they were going to fall. And so it's good to have some cognizance for what are Taylor rules implying? We should at least get somewhere close to where they currently imply. And so it was an aspirational upper bound. Now, on the way down, inflation is also falling pretty fast. We would not advise that the Fed mechanically follow Taylor rules in any case. But I think it is telling if there is a big deviation emerging between what rules imply and where the Fed's policy stance is. And when you get pretty far away, I think at least think about them as an aspirational lower bound, right? So you can lag where the Taylor rule actually says policy rates should go. Lag if you must, but follow inflation proportionally, right? That there should be some proportional, the larger the inflation overshoot, the higher policy rates are. The lower the inflation overshoot or the higher the undershoot potentially, God, that might seem unthinkable, but it at least seems plausible over the course of the next four to six quarters. If we see that, interest rates should move proportionally on that side too. And we'll see like how this stuff plays out. But I think that proportionality would be wise. That proportionality also comes with certain like more specific interest rate prescriptions. As I said, we can follow this stuff with a lag, don't follow it mechanically, but it does have some implication for how the Fed should manage policy rates. Preston? Yeah, I think the one important reason why is that, as Scott had mentioned, on the way up, the reaction function was pretty legible. You know, inflation comes in higher than expected and the Fed's going to raise the rate path. Now we're in the opposite direction. So inflation has the price of the downside relative to Fed projections. So six-month core PCE is running under 2%. It might not stay there, but at least that's what it is right now. The 12-month core PCE growth is sitting at 3.2% ending November. So we're currently beating every projection, every one of the summary of economic projections since December 22, which had a 5 and one eighths terminal federal funds rate projection. And if you look at, for example, you know, if you go to the Cleveland Fed, they publish this site where they show the Taylor Rule prescriptions from a bunch of different variants on the Taylor Rule, and they're all generally implying that we're currently higher than what those rules would suggest. If we stay high while inflation is is going down, this introduces a lot of uncertainty for market participants because it really raises questions about what is the Fed's reaction function, and it becomes less predictable. If we stay high, the Fed is going to have to communicate somehow around why they're staying high, why they think there are inflation risks, or if they think our star is higher. Once you get into that, it can be totally impossible to now cast and market participants are going to be, you know, very, it it introduces a lot of possibility for confusion there. I I think if you look at a Taylor rule prescription here, you're going to get some, the Taylor principle says sort of 150 basis points for every 100 basis points change in inflation. We'll see how fast this goes. It could mean something that averages after 25 basis points per meeting. It could be slower. It could be something marginally faster. But that's a general prescription for pace. And as we said, it, the downside risks give some reason for moving a little faster sooner on the cuts, but also slowing down as you go. These are all things to kind of keep in mind as you kind of move through this process, just how much like proportionality is important on both sides, being symmetric with the lag, obviously, I, I would say the Fed is operating with lag already, and we're not here to tell them to sort of, you have to react to a six-month core PCE, but the more this snowballs, the more compelling the case for cuts becomes. So we're going to move on now to our final topic, but listeners, there is more to this article, so we'll provide the link to it. Check it out. They have another point they make. Again, the, the title of the paper was Three Motivations for Interest Rate Normalization, a Playbook for Fed Policy in 2024, and we know Fed officials are listening to guys, so maybe they'll be taking notes as they listen to the show. But I want to move on to the Fed's framework review because this is something near and dear to my heart and I believe to your heart as well. And I want to motivate it by going back to a speech that Jay Powell gave in November of last year. And it was at an IMF conference. 
And I'm just going to summarize that. We'll probably link to the speech. But three things he does in that speech. Number one, he goes back and he assesses this whole experience, just like we've been doing today. He goes back, he reflects, looks over it. And he says, you know, one of the things we're taught, kind of central banking 101, is to see through supply shocks. And we're doing, we're an inflation targeter, see through supply shocks. And he went on and he said, what was interesting is that it's very hard in real time to distinguish inflation caused by supply shocks versus inflation caused by demand shocks. So the first point I want to highlight, he stresses there's this kind of knowledge problem. We don't know, how do I know this month's inflation was due to some kind of demand shock or supply shock? It's not very practical. Second thing he points out is that even if it is a supply shock, and even though we're told to look through it, if it lasts long enough, if it's persistent enough, he's now more worried about inflation expectations becoming unanchored. In other words, he's worried that this advice might actually lead to the Fed losing inflation credibility. So these first two points are how do we deal with supply shocks in a way that can acknowledge our ignorance, but also keep you know, inflation anchored. And the third thing he said at this speech, which again ties into what we're talking about, is we are going to do a Fed framework review. He announced it at the end of this talk. So Skanda and Preston, when I read this, I was like, wow, this speech is screaming nominal GDP targeting or or labor income targeting. It's just crying out, help me, give me some kind of new framework. So I don't know, what have you been thinking about the framework coming up this year? What are your hopes and maybe what are your expectations for it? I think my expectations and hopes overlap quite a bit. Nominal GDP or nominal gross labor income targeting or nominal consumer spending targeting. You want to take any of those sorts of lenses. They're all, they overlap quite a bit. These are all things that I think their biggest benefit is in the fog of supply shocks in the fog of when price inflation can rear its head sometimes it coincides with income growth also being really strong as i would describe it for much of 2021 and 2022 and even parts of 2023 for that matter income growth is also strong through much of this period spending growth is also strong in nominal terms so the fixation on inflation ultimately didn't like catch the fed off sides all the way through, but it did sort of make things messy about how much does the Fed need to raise rates, how long does the Fed need to keep interest rates high, especially since some of these phenomena can be very volatile. What is scarier is what happened in 2008 in the sense that we had the divergence of nominal aggregates and nominal spending growth and nominal income growth relative to inflation itself, which was accelerating. So that is a place where I would say supply shocks can distort both nominal aggregates and price aggregates both, but they distort price aggregates a lot more, or at least they affect them a lot more. And so if you want something more stable, this is one method for being able to really see through that fog. It's not not perfect, but nominal aggregates are much more robust in the face of these types of dynamics. There's a lot of weird stuff that can move prices around that don't really have anything to do with what monetary policy should be trying to shape. And I think that's a big chunk of what you're decided about, what motivates Powell to think about a framework review here. And I think it's the right place to look. I would say that's the main one of the main reasons why I favor moving to something that looks more like nominal labor income targeting, because the volume of labor income growth is a better guide to these types of macro pressures rather than what CPI or PCE would say in any given moment. Now, Employ America puts out a gross labor income uh, measure, don't you, every quarter? Yes, we we look at multiple measures, but there are a couple of metrics on job growth and wage growth that are particularly important and significant to us. They do point to normalization here. We probably had really strong rates of gross labor income growth for much of 2021, which is in some ways part of what catch-up job growth needed to look like for us to get back to pre-pandemic rates of employment. We still had pretty strong in 2022 and even 2023. Now those measures look much more just in line with pre-pandemic outcomes, if anything, a little soft, just because job growth has cooled quite a bit on some of the key measures we look at. 
And that's just to us tells us, yeah, we're in a more normalized state of the world now. Nominal growth is definitely come in line. And it also means like the Fed should pay attention to that too. And this is one of the critiques of this approach is, well, you guys don't have the good data. And I, we just talked about Skanda's measure at Employee America. And I would argue more generally, the data you have is endogenous to the framework you pick. If we were to pick this approach, the Fed could generate more of the data that would help it inform its decision making. So I, I think the data concern is a little overstated. Another critique that is often stated is the communication issue to this approach. I often hear people say, oh, everyone understands inflation. I'm not sure about that. I think we both agree people, households confuse gas prices with inflation often. Um, but I even had a chance to share this with uh, Chair Powell. I was at a Fed Lessons event. And between in a session, I, I chatted to him and I even asked him, hey, what do you think about nominal GDP targeting? And you know, his concern was communication. And I think the argument we can make, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, is that if you are talking to different groups, you can still make this pitch. So if I'm talking to like a labor group, you say, hey, we're trying to stabilize labor incomes. If I'm talking to a trade group, we're trying to stabilize total sales because they're the flip side of each other, at least in the aggregate. And to me, that's very intuitive, some level more intuitive than telling someone, hey, we want to increase your prices. We, want, we think that inflation has to go up for the economy to stabilize. Yeah, and I think like, what you're saying here is also something that gets at the causality issues in some ways very clearly, which is, what is the Fed actually influencing in direct terms? I would say financial conditions are a really important signal for how economic actors respond in terms of spending decisions, spending on hiring, spending on their operating budget, capital budget, mortgage rates affect willingness to buy a house. That's like the stuff of monetary transmission mechanisms. The pricing of goods and services, I mean, I'd be curious whether how much does someone at Amazon pay attention who sets prices, how much do they pay attention to what Jay Powell is saying or even what Jay Powell is directly signaling? Right? These things get refracted through more lenses by the time you get to prices. It's not to say prices are also have a macro component to them, but it's just like it's messy, right? And I think the press is also kind of noted this in his work so like this, this stuff has got a lot of the parsing of this stuff is uh, is very difficult in the context of price aggregates Preston? well i mean just think about the conversation we've been having today trying to think about what's driving inflation or disinflation is it supply is it demand is it going to be transitory is it not you know scon and i have our view but we're not even that confident about the necessarily about the magnitudes of each factor and other people definitely disagree with us. Powell has to talk about the three categories of inflation all the time. And I think he's getting sick of talking about goods, housing, and core non-housing services. I think it's going to be much more easier if he just moves to thinking about a nominal aggregate rather than trying to think about what's happening to price index and is, you know, is this month's print being driven by imputed financial services or something like that? Yeah. There's a lot of silly stuff in this called super core inflation that the Fed is citing it's called core non-housing services. It includes a bunch of junk, a better term, is a lot of stuff the Fed should not be paying attention to. Various things where there's no market price. Various things where it's sensitive to the price of equities directly because it's portfolio management services. This is not the stuff that's like, actually, you think this is good communication? Do we think this is actually like a clear, transparent way of getting at the cost of living struggles that people are facing? I would say the Fed, when the economy looks hot, is obviously concerned about making sure the volume of nominal consumption growth is sustainable for what the economy can supply. And that's why you should be attentive to nominal consumption growth. And I would say its cousin, or the other side of the coin, is the nominal labor income growth side. We want to make sure people have enough incomes to be able to spend. And those two things are very connected for very fundamental causal reasons. Labor income growth and consumer spending growth go hand in hand. Managing those to keep them in a sustainable range over time. Obviously, supply is dynamic. Supply does mean that like sometimes the economy can accommodate more volume of nominal consumer spending growth and sometimes less. But that's the thing the Fed's trying to manage. There are a lot of collateral damage issues that still remain, but it still is clearer communication to say we're trying to manage paycheck growth in the aggregate. 
We're trying to manage consumer spending growth in the aggregate and make sure those things really line up well. I think that's much cleaner than saying, I don't know, core non-housing services. These things are you're getting drilling down X food, X energy, X housing, X goods. It starts to not really sound very publicly understandable. No, absolutely. And I think this year is going to be an interesting one to follow with this conversation. I know Employ America and Mercatus Center will be engaged on this topic. And I really hope that the Fed Framework Review is a fruitful, serious consideration of ways to make the Fed more effective, communicate better, and to consider all the options possible. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guests today have been Skanda Amarnath and Preston Mui. Skanda and Preston, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks our pleasure. Us. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dive deeper into our research at mercatus.org forward slash monetary policy. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you like this podcast, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the show. Find me on Twitter at David Beckworth and follow the show at macro underscore musings. <laughs>